kicking off. Everybody come in here. Have a seat. And for those of you who might not have figured this out yet or might not be familiar, I'm this guy. I'm <laughs> I am best known probably to you as Bowser from the group Sha Na Na. But much more importantly today, I am actually here in my capacity as president of Social Security Works PAC. And the message I am bringing to you is that on the night of November 6th, Liz Watson has got to be doing this. Don't worry, I'll train you. Can you believe that I've been making a living now for almost 50 years doing this? God bless America! And yes, you know that I love the music of the 50s and the early 60s. However, that does not mean that I actually want to return to the 50s and the early 60s. Because that was a time before Medicare. And in the time before Medicare, over 35% of American seniors had incomes below the poverty line. It's a big number. And I certainly do not want to return to a time before Social Security was passed in 1935, when, think about this, more than one out of every two, over 50% of American seniors had incomes below the poverty line. Social Security and Medicare are the two most successful domestic programs in the entire history of the United States of America. And you know what? Indiana's ninth district. We need to keep them that way. In fact, we need to expand them. And that is why I've taken on this responsibility, entirely voluntary, of being president of Social Security Works PAC. This is my 46th campaign stop. By the time I am done, I will have gone from Alaska to South Florida and Northern Maine to Southern California in search of candidates who will protect and advance the quality of life of older Americans. And very clearly, we have found one such candidate here in the 9th District of Indiana. Now let me tell you how we do this. This won't take long, but I'm going to tell you exactly how we do this. We send out this questionnaire, and I'm going to read you the five questions because they're all to the point today. Candidate's name, Liz Watson. Social Security. Will you support expanding, not cutting Social Security? Please note that cutting includes raising the retirement age, using a less generous cost of living adjustment, privatizing the worst idea of all, as well as simply reducing or eliminating benefits. So the question is, will you support expanding, not cutting Social Security? Liz Watson's answer is yes, yes. <laughs> Medicare and Medicaid. Number two, will you support expanding, not cutting Medicare? Yes! And in fact, we know that Liz Watson is in fact for Medicare for all. Do you support the expansion of Medicaid eligibility contained in the Affordable Care Act? And will you oppose all attempts to cut Medicaid? Yes! Yes! I want to say a couple of words about Medicaid just really quick. Medicaid's turning a corner in America because people are beginning to understand that Medicaid pays for two-thirds of long-term care, and more and more American families are affected by long-term care. People are beginning to wake up and realize, oh my God, that's my grandfather, that's my brother, that's me. So Medicaid, Medicaid is turning a corner as we speak, and of course, Liz Watson supports the Medicaid expansion. Anybody in this room uh, think they're paying too little for their prescription drugs? <laughs> Will you support efforts to lower prescription drug prices, including allowing Medicare and other federal programs to negotiate for lower prices? What could be more obvious than that? Liz Watson says, yes. <laughs> yes. 
And remember that nothing stands in between Medicare and negotiating for lower drug, the ability to negotiate for lower drug prices, but the United States Congress and the president, of course, at this point. Final question, will you always refer to Social Security and Medicare as earned benefits? Because that is what they are. Will you never use the pejorative word entitlements? And of course, Liz Watson says, yes, she will always refer to these programs as earned benefits that you paid into for your entire working lives and you get the benefits when you need them. So, Liz Watson returns a perfect questionnaire. Let's talk about the incumbent for just a second and then I'll be done. Um, for this, I like to use the Alliance for Retired Americans scorecard because this quantifies the voting record of people who are already in Congress. And what they do at the Alliance is they pick 10 issues that are important to seniors. They discuss, they analyze how the congressman voted on those 10 issues. And I am here to tell you that I am the person in America best qualified to summarize Trey Hollingsworth's voting record on senior issues. You may find that to be a little strange, but I'm going to explain it to you. Okay, these 10 issues, you get 10% for each one you get correct, you get zero for each one you get wrong. What do you think Trey Hollingsworth's voting record has been on senior issues in his time so far in Congress? It is, I'll give you a hint, say it with me, a great big fat zero. 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 Now, why am I the person best qualified to comment on this? Anybody seen the movie Grease? Okay, in that movie Grease, my old group Shanana sings every song in the big scene at the hop. One whole side of what was then the biggest selling soundtrack album of all time. And I am the guy who during the contest, the dance contest, when Chacha Di Gregorio is dancing with Danny Zuko, I unwittingly in 1978 was summarizing Trey Hollingsworth's voting record on senior issues. Because I'm actually the guy who said, how low can you go? Say it with me, how low can you go, Trey Hollingsworth? How low can you go? How low can you go? Because Trey Hollingsworth has actually found as low as you can go. You cannot go lower than zero. So these are the reasons I stand before you today as president of Social Security Works PAC. And I endorse Liz Watson to be the next congresswoman from the great 9th District of Indiana. And here she is. Please welcome Liz Watson.
Some of you heard at the rally today, this is not a theoretical issue for me. This is personal. <laughs> Medicare and Social Security are really why I get to sit up here next to Senator Bernie Sanders today. See, when my dad was a kid and his father died, it was my grandma's meager paycheck as an office manager and Social Security survivor's benefits that meant my dad and his two little brothers weren't homeless. <clears throat> and my dad went to college right here at Indiana University of Bloomington, and that was paid for, paid for by the GI Bill after he served in the Navy. He was the first in his family to go to college, and tonight he's receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award from the university. That's what happened when he was at Reality is that you have a Congress that... Now, when you turn on the television and you hear poor Ryan getting up there and say, gee, I am really worried about the deficit. And you know, the deficit is soaring. Duh, no kidding. That's what happens when you give a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top 1%. So how are they going to deal with the growing deficit? Well, I think John and Liz made that point. They're going to deal with the deficit that they cause by giving tax breaks to billionaires by trying to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And when you hear Ryan and others talk about entitlement reform, hang on to your wallet, folks, because when they talk about entitlement reform, they mean cuts, drastic cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. In terms of Social Security, as John mentioned, it might be the so-called chain CPI. That's a fancy term that nobody in America knows. But you know what that means? It means the COLAs that seniors now get, which are scarce and limited. Am I right? They're terrible. And they want to cut them back even further. Or they want to raise the retirement age for Medicare. I never could understand. I know it's true in Vermont, and I'm sure it's true here in Indiana. You got seniors out there trying to get by on twelve or thirteen thousand dollars a year. Think about it. How in God's name can anybody make it? How do you stay warm in the winter? How do you feed yourself? How do you pay for the medicine that you need on thirteen thousand dollars a year? You can't do it, and that's why we're going to expand benefits for lower income seniors. All right? And we do that by lifting that cap on Social Security taxes. A number of years ago, before I was in the Senate, I was in the House. And I went up to the northern part of our state called Franklin County. And I took a bus ride with mostly women. You know where we went? We went to Montreal, Canada. And we didn't go on a sightseeing tour. The reason we went with mostly women to Montreal was to buy prescription drugs that those women, many of whom were struggling with breast cancer, and many of them were working class women. And I will never forget, as long as I live, and we had arranged all of these things, so we walked into a pharmacy uh, in Montreal, and women were buying breast cancer medicine. One particular brand comes to mind, uh, and that was called Tamoxifen, still widely used. And you know what the difference, differential then was in Canada for Tamoxifen compared to Vermont? Anyone want to guess? They paid one-tenth the price for the same bloody medicine. And right now, all over the world, as you all know, the exact same medicine sold in the United States is sold for a fraction of the price. Canada actually is fairly high. You go to Europe, you go to New Zealand, prices are much, much lower for exactly the same medicine. Turns out the reason for that is over the last 20 years, pharmaceutical industry has spent $4 billion in lobbying and campaign contributions. $4 billion. I was out in California a couple of years ago working with folks there to lower the cost of the prescription drugs. In one state, on one ballot item, they spent $131 million. 
Meanwhile, one out of five Americans cannot afford the medicine they need, and many seniors cut their pills in half because they can't afford the medicine that they have to take. So yes, we have got to take on, Liz is absolutely right, John is right. We have to take on the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of ways that we can do it. Right now, the VA pays substantially less for the medicine that they use, that they buy, than Medicaid. You know why? Because they negotiate prices, which is what Canada does, which is what every other country on earth does. So our job is to tell the pharmaceutical industry that they're not going to continue to get away with murder. They're not going to force us to pay the highest prices in the world. One way is having Medicare start negotiating prices. The other way is giving Americans the opportunity of purchasing safe medicine in, from abroad at a fraction of the prices we're forced to pay right now. But all of this stuff gets down to money and politics. It gets down to the fact, as Liz mentioned, that there are many members of Congress much more interested in getting their campaign contributions from the pharmaceutical industry and from the insurance companies than protecting the needs of working Americans. And that has got to change, and this election is what that is about. So please, do everything you can in the next two weeks to elect Liz to the United States Congress. We desperately need her. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Sanders. We are so thrilled to have a wonderful panel here with us today, and we're going to hear your thoughts on how we can protect and strengthen Medicare and Social Security and other things that we need to do to make sure that our seniors uh, can have a secure and dignified retirement. So I think we're going to start with Mayor Allison. I'm Tommy Allison, uh, the former mayor of Bloomington, and I believe in democracy, representative government, and the right to petition our government for redress of grievances. Elected officials represent us. They need to listen to us. Belief in government gave us Social Security in 1935, and where would we be without it? I know families who depend on it to care for grandchildren caught in the opiate crisis. Social Security is probably the greatest safety net this country ever had. It makes my life more secure but for some, it is a real lifeline. We need to make sure Social Security is safe and here for those who come after us. Belief in government gave us Medicare and a sensible policy about pre-existing conditions. I know a middle-class couple, self-employed, with pre-existing conditions. Before Obamacare, they worried and worried whether they could make it to the age of eligibility for Medicare. Many people were in that situation, grasping for a Medicare lifeline out of reach, just out of reach. Too many people, too many Americans lack adequate health care, not health insurance, health care. Politicians may say Medicare for all is too costly. What's really costly is the lack of Medicare for all. <clears throat> there is a way to ease into Medicare for all gradually without upsetting the universe. Call it 
Baby Care, Medicare. And it's embarrassingly simple. Enroll every newborn baby in Medicare. If we do that, it won't be overnight, but it won't be long before every living American is enrolled in Medicare. Think about it. To save Social Security and Medicare, we need a Liz Watson Congress. <laughs> now about Medicaid and Indiana. I have had personal experience with it. My mother came to live with us in their last years of her life. She lived to be 104 years old. She had exhausted her savings. And, in, and when she, I was no longer able to transfer her from her bed, she had to go to a nursing home. Medicaid, Medicaid was her life saving where we could afford a nursing home. These services that government supply is what we want our government to supply. We need Liz Watson in Congress. She will work for us because she has the right core values. So my name is Rob Stone, and I'm used to talking about 30 or 40 or 50 minutes on health care, so I'm going to try to reel it in here. Um, when I, could I stand? Sure. So when I was a young medical student in 1974, I lived in Thetford Hill in Vermont, and I voted for the Liberty Union candidates uh, on the ballot that year. In, I voted for Bernie uh, for Senate. <laughs> so I'm a little starstruck being on this stage tonight, today, with Liz. <laughs> and Bernie. <laughs> so since 2005, uh, I, I, I had to take a second job as a doctor, and I started working with uh, a group called Physicians for a National Health Program and uh, uh, started a chapter in Indiana, and many of you here have heard me talk uh, about that, and, and many of you are members, and my wife Karen's over here with our uh, Medicare for All uh, t-shirt uh, with Martin Luther King quoted on the back. Um, of all forms, hold still, dear. If of all form, turn back towards me. Of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And I've never been more optimistic about our chances for getting a universal healthcare system, Medicare for all, than I am today. I've never been more optimistic. <laughs> and we've got a lot of work to do, and it's not going to be easy. But in a, in a district as red as the ninth district has been gerrymandered into, for a candidate like Liz to come out forcefully and courageously right from the start saying we need Medicare for all is just absolutely inspiring. It's just cool. <laughs> and I'm on Medicare myself now. I've been on Medicare for a year and a half. I've, I've survived it. It's a great, I feel, I love having Medicare insurance and I love taking care of Medicare patients. I've got no problem taking care of Medicare patients. I've, got, I've never had a problem taking care of Medicaid patients or people who couldn't pay either. But, you know, we know we're already taking care of people like me, 65 and above, who are the most expensive, the most complicated, the most difficult patients uh, to take care. We're already doing it. 
So now we just got to cover the younger people who are healthier and cheaper and easier. Uh, and we looked at every other country in the world, um, every other developed country in the world, uh, and they can do it for less than we're spending. So it's really doable. And people talk about, oh, God, they're going to ration health care. Oh, they're going to ration health care. And of course, I mean, you've seen it just like I have, you know, you, you go over to your doctor's office and there's there's two doors to get in the doctor's office. And the one has has the Medicare says Medicare. All the people are lined up. Uh, the poor old seniors, you know, they're waiting. And then on the other side, it says younger than Medicare. And they're just walking in and out. And of course, I'm just making all this up. Uh, we're not rationing health care under Medicare. We're not going to need to ration health care. We already ration health care in this country by ability to pay. We ration, we ration health care more than any other country in the world. And that's why we have such terrible statistics, why our maternal mortality, our infant mortality is so terrible, why our life expectancy is so terrible, why we have so much premature uh, illness and death, and why we have so many people who go bankrupt because of health care. So I'm just getting warmed up, and I'm going to bring it right down now. Um, I've never been more optimistic that we can make this happen, so let's make it happen, and we can do it right here. Let's get Liz elected, and we're on our way. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Nicole Yates, and I am the district director for Congressman John Yarmouth in Kentucky, but I live in southern Indiana. And so I come today um, before you to tell you about what I see every day in my office. And that is seniors who are coming in and they're at their wits end already because the last thing they want to do is to ask for help. Most of them are forced into Social Security and Medicaid. They really don't want to do it because they know that they can't afford to live on it. However, their health is failing them because they are elderly. So most of them come in my office. It takes a little bit. Once they've signed up, they're confused about signing up. You have to go and wait and stand in line. But then once it's there, they are very confused and concerned that it is going to be cut. And so they are worried that they won't be able to take their medicine or they'll have to take half of their medicine, or they won't be able to pay their rent because they need to buy their medicine. And so they're coming in asking for assistance. But by the time they go to these places that offer assistance, they don't qualify for them. And so that is just upsets them more. I have a mother who is 80 years old. Last week, I went to pick up her insulin at Walgreens and it was $117. So when I took it back to her at my home, she said, well, last month it was $47. So in a month's time, her insulin went up to $70. Now my mother has eight children, so she'll never have to take half of her medicine or not take it at all. But what about all the other people who don't have eight children to look after them? And so we, this is why it is very important that people like Liz Watson is elected to Congress so that she can go and help my boss and others fight to get Medicare for all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Green, and I'm a retired English teacher from Bloomington High School North. I taught there for 26 years. And um, I'm working with Liz's campaign, basically with her young interns, because they're so much like my high school students. Um, they're talented, well, <laughs> they're a little, little more focused. Um, they're talented, they're energetic, they're resourceful, and most of all, they're determined to stand with Liz in her fight to represent all Hoosiers. After spending the last year working with her, what's most important to me is that I know she's also going to represent me. As a retired educator, I know Liz will work to protect me, unlike those in Washington who make arbitrary decisions about my future and yet never show up to hear what really matters to me. 
I need to give you just a little bit of background to explain to you why I retired just a few years earlier than what I had originally planned. At the time of my retirement in 2015, remember this was pre-election, um, several critical junctures had been reached in the school district that influenced my decision to retire. First was the end of a three-year contract that the teachers union had negotiated with the MCCSC that locked in our pay and benefits for those three years and that delayed the implementation of merit-based pay based on standardized test scores. In addition, voucher programs were about to explode in Indiana that would siphon critical resources from our public schools. Healthcare costs were at an all-time high, and Indiana had just stripped our teachers' unions from negotiating anything but salary. In addition, in its wisdom, the state was manipulating the retirement reserves of all of its state employees to balance the budget. On a personal level, I could see that all of these factors would have a negative impact on my financial future if I stayed in education. I knew I had a decent pension coming from the state from my years of teaching, that is if they didn't spend it all, I had just, just enough money in my VEBA health account to cover my share of health care premiums until I hit 65, and my husband was still working. I was not ready to stop being an educator. I loved what I did. But I could see so many negative forces at work on my financial future and the world of education and all of us that financially it seemed to make the most sense to me. Today, however, Three years post-retirement, my financial security has been totally shattered. This year, my health insurance copay is nearly $150 more per month than when I retired. And because of that increase, it will run out this next February, a full year before I turn 65. That means I will be paying out of pocket more than $500 a month for my share of my health care premium. I know that's cheap on the market today, but I have no clue where that money is coming from. Added to all that, after an earlier than planned retirement from his job for health reasons, my husband faced an $18,000 emergency hospitalization this past year that Medicare refuses to cover simply because the provider doesn't have the right code in their system. So here I am today scrambling to come up with an extra 500 a month to pay health care premiums and another 18,000 to pay for my husband's emergency hospitalization. Quite honestly, as I said before, I don't know where that money is going to come from. Mostly in part due to two other factors that are now added in the mix. The, later ta the latest tax bill, as Senator Sanders mentioned, threatens to decrease my monthly pension payment. And as everyone here has said today, our current leaders are on the verge of cutting Social Security benefits. Benefits that all of us have paid into and, all of us, and that all of us deserve. We've, made, we've all made decisions about our financial future based on the belief that we have representatives working in Washington for us. That programs we have faithfully paid into would be there for our retirement. After the last couple of years, however, it appears that what really matters to them is their own financial gain carried on the backs of people like you and me. For the first time in my adult life, I am really scared. And that's why I'm here today. I know that Liz Watson and Senator Sanders have fresh ideas for making sure that the average Americans like you and me who have worked hard to enhance the fabric of our country will have health care safe pensions, social security benefits, and hope for our future. Thank you. My name's Nancy Hutchins, and social security and Medicare saved my life. In 2007, I was diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer. Um, I was living in New York where I'd lived for 25 or 30 years, and I had great treatment. Uh, at the end of my treatment, I did what most cancer patients do. They go to their oncologist and say, what can I do? What's within my control to help take care of my health? And my oncologist said, one of the most important things you can do, especially with the kind of cancer you have, is 
to reduce stress. Well, at that time, I was selling real estate for Sotheby's in Chappaqua, New York. That's one of the hottest real estate markets in the country. This was just before the financial crisis. This was not a good place to be to reduce stress. And so my husband Michael and I sort of said, we really have to make some tough decisions here. And I grew up on a farm outside of Bloomington in Greene County, went to IU, have family all over Bloomington, always wanted to return here. And so it seemed like a good time to move back here. And I had just turned 62, so I qualified for Social Security. And so that was the money that enabled us to get out of New York, to get out of that incredibly stressful time. And you can only imagine what would have happened if I'd stayed, uh, at any rate, to come back here. And so I was three years away from Medicare. And so I got into, after a lot of jumping around, got into the Indiana high risk pool. This was before the ACA. I cannot begin to tell you how expensive it was. This was not a long term solution for anybody, barely a solution at all. But I got into the high risk pool. We knew it would only be for three years until I got into Medicare which it was, got into Medicare when I was 65 and got a really good supplement, which was important with my health. And so then in 2014, some things were going on with me. My doctors here in Bloomington weren't sure. I decided to go to MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. That's the best cancer hospital in the world for ovarian cancer. So I went down there and I had to go back and forth because they couldn't really figure it out. They eventually found, yes, I was having a recurrence, I had a very complex surgery by the best cancer liver surgeon in the world, and I was great. I had to go back for some more treatment. I was back and forth, and then I had chemo from my doctors here in Bloomington. Do you know how much that cost me? Zero. Zero. All that. I paid airfare, hotel bills, and for some restaurants. Other than that, Medicare and my supplement covered all of that treatment. And, uh, and so it, it literally saved my life. Um, right now, uh, I'm finding that the supplement that I have has been, it's called Plan F. Many of you may be familiar with it. It's being closed out, which means that those of us who live to be very, very long, I'm told, it will begin to get very, very expensive. So I've tried to get in the plan that they recommend. Well, I've been turned down twice because of my health history, although technically I qualify, but then they look at it and they say, no, we don't want you. So anyway, these are the kinds of things. I was just saying to Rob that I'm in a situation where if, when I, if I have a recurrence, which is likely, um, I almost wish it would happen sooner rather than later because of the fact that I feel more confident I would be able to actually get treatment. That's a sad thing to say. I also want to say one more thing about Social Security. We were able to hold off my husband Michael from getting full Social Security. When he was 65, he was able to draw on my Social Security, which gave us more income to be able to last longer. And he was able to hold out until 70, which was very important to me because, at some, I, I mean, in all likelihood, I'll die a long time before he does. And that means that he'll have a little more income when my income goes away. So the two points I want to make here are really important. One is these programs work and they are fit together, they are orchestrated so that they match. And when these guys in Washington start tinkering around with them, they don't care anything about how the pieces fit together. And it's really important because they can destroy, uh, any one of these elements gets pulled out and all of a sudden the whole rug is pulled out from under you. And so the second point is I met Liz Watson in June of 2017, I had been looking for somebody that could beat Trey Hollingsworth. And I met her and I said, this lady can do it. And she is somebody who truly understands all these things and can put the pieces together and will be in there fighting for us and knows how to do it and will, has the backbone to do it. So I've been here fighting for her and I think probably everybody here is doing the same thing. So we all are keeping our fingers crossed and saying our prayers for November uh, for the 6th. <laughs> I'll run it over to Bill. Here you go, Bill. 
Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. I am William Hosea, a local all-around great guy. <laughs> and I'm also a veteran. I'm proud of that. I'm proud to support Liz Watson, and I'm proud to say I voted for Senator Sanders. Um, everybody who spoke before me, I think they spoke very well about these issues that we came to talk about today. Um, but I want to make one quick point about veterans, and that is that contrary to what a lot of people might know, is that veterans depend on Social Security and Medicare just as much as everybody else. A lot of people think, well, you don't have to worry about that. You have VA health care. In many cases, that's true. In most cases, it is not. The VA does not take care or provide health care for all veterans. When we are discharged from the military, unless you have some service-connected disability, then you don't rate uh, VA health care. Even if you do have a service-connected disability, they'll give you a portion of it dependent on exactly what your disability is. That could range anywhere from 10% to 20%. And so most veterans, again, uh, do not rate VA health care. Um, and we depend on Social Security and Medicare as much as anyone else. Now, that was the, the point that I wanted to make about uh, veterans. I also wanted to say that I, I met Liz Watson back in 2017. And I've come to know her as very personable. She's approachable. She's been to my home. And whenever I, I call Liz Watson, she'll do one of two things. She'll either answer the phone or she'll call me back. So I just want to say that for the next two weeks, I think it is important for all of us to do everything that we can. If you haven't voted, go ahead and vote. Uh, talk to other people, convince them to vote, and support Liz Watson. Thank you very much. You want to go here? My friends, I'm looking at the folks on this panel, and, and many of whom I have gotten to work hard with uh, over the course of the past year, and I know that goes for many of you out here in this room as well. We have worked so hard to make the change we need in the Ninth District, and I am so thankful for each and every one of you for everything that you have done. This campaign, we've knocked 68,000 doors. We have an army. An army of volunteers out making phone calls, talking to voters, talking about what it means to vote for representatives who are going to show up and who actually care about us. The conversation we had here today is an important one. It's important to talk about what it is that we need to do to fight for Medicare and Social Security, two of the best things this con our Congress, not this Congress, our, our Congress has ever done. Social Security is a national savings account for all of us that we pay into. And it's paid for itself since the beginnings. Before Social Security, one in two seniors died in poverty. About 22 million seniors today would live below the poverty level if not for Social Security benefits. Medicare provides a quality health care for our seniors. And it doesn't have to pay stock dividends and multi-million dollar CEO salaries to do it. But our leaders in Washington, they don't care about any of this. We have corrupt politicians who are calling the shots in Washington and who are refusing to listen to reason. We need more people in Washington who have both a backbone and a moral compass, like Senator Bernie Sanders. Yeah. 
It's not okay that we have elected Trey Hollingsworth and a whole lot of other Trey Hollingsworths across this country who see the money that we pay for into these programs as their piggy bank. It's not okay. They want to come for Medicare and Social Security to plug the trillions of dollars in deficits that they've created by giving a huge tax cut to the 1%? This is madness, and it needs to end. All of us need to speak up and use our voice and say that corrupt Washington's values are not our values. See, I know this because I've been out in the district, in all 13 counties, really listening. And we can't say the same for Trey Hollingsworth. He doesn't come here to listen to you for a very simple reason. He doesn't care about you. <sighs> Have you had enough of a Congress that takes its cues exclusively from its wealthy corporate donors? Yes. Have you had enough of a Congress that is in the pockets of the pharmaceutical industry, the banking industry, the insurance companies. Yes. I've had enough too. And I say enough is enough. So what do you need to do, my friends? Vote. 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 What's that? Vote. Vote. All right, we know what we need to do. We've got 18 days left before the most important election of our lifetime. Yes, vote. And I want you to take a buddy or two or three or 20 or 100 with you to the polls. Yes, you need to do that. Go out and do it right now. We're in early vote. We win when we vote. And I need you to come in and help us too. Because the fact is, my friends, this is a grassroots movement. We are going to win in November by going to the doors, by changing hearts and minds. Because look, Hoosiers are with us, but they need to hear from us. So right now, I'm calling on each and every one of you to join me, to join me in the next 18 days, to make this your single, single highest priority for 18 days that we have left before the most important election of our lifetime. I need you. And all of Indiana needs you. Your country needs you. Thank you very much. And I just want to say, having Senator Bernie Sanders join us here today to spend a day with us in Bloomington to help us make the change we need. It is the honor of a lifetime to be joined by you, Senator Sanders, and thank you so much. What can I say? <laughs> uh, you have heard it all. And let me just close by saying this, and I think you all know it. On virtually every single issue that's out there, the issue of campaign finance reform and stopping billionaires from buying elections, the issue of voter suppression, trying literally to prevent people in America from voting, on issues like Medicare for All, the last poll that I saw, I want you all to know this, because you're gonna see these TV ads attacking Liz, Medicare for All, Last poll I saw, 70% of the American people want Medicare for all. People are sick and tired of a $7.25 minimum wage. They want to raise that wage to a living wage. And they want pay equity for women, equal pay for equal work. People want criminal justice reform. Despite Trump's demonizing immigrants, vast majority of the American people want immigration reform. Despite Trump not being sure if climate change is real, overwhelming majority of the American people know it's real, and they want to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel. We have on issue after issue, virtually every issue, 
gun safety legislation. We have the American people behind us. These guys keep winning because four years ago in Indiana and all over America, in Vermont, voter turnout was embarrassingly and abysmally low. My state, it was the lowest since World War II. In your state, it was the lowest in the country. 70%, as I understand it, of people in Indiana did not vote. And that is what right-wing Republicans and their billionaire sponsors want. They want to buy elections and make sure that working people and young people, people of color, are not voting. This November 6th, we've got to turn all that around. Yes. And they may have a lot of money. They may have a lot of money, and they do have a lot of money. A lot of ugly TV ads, lying TV ads going on all over this country. But at the end of the day, if we stand up, if we fight back, if we come out to vote, Liz is going to win and some great people all over this country are going to win. We're going to begin the process of transforming this country. Thank you all. So stay here for the final song. This is where you come in. This is where you come in. Between now and November 6th, you need to call every phone in the 9th District. You need to knock every door in the 9th District. You need to get everyone to come out to bum ba ba bum ba bum ba bum bum ba bum ba ba bum ba dang a dang dang a ding a dong ding. Vote for Liz Watson. But the final song is a little bit different from that, and I want you all to sing along with it. Everybody knows this song as Good Night, Sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. But today, we're going to change the words a little bit. Sing along with me. Do, 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 do. Good night, Trey Hollingsworth. Well, it's time to go. Do, 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 do. Good night, Trey Hollingsworth. Well, it's time to go. Do, 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 do. Don't hate to leave you, but we really must say good night, Trey Hollingsworth. Good night. Do, 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 do. Good night, Trey Hollingsworth. Good night. Do, 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 do. Good night, Trey Hollingsworth. Vote for Liz Watson! Thank you all for